You don't want to miss this episode. We're going to talk about the May update. What's going on? What's happening? Let's find out. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Control and Compound. I'm Darren Mitchell. Joining me as always, Christina White. Christina, how are you doing today? Hey, Darren. I am doing great today. We're into May. Can't believe we're this far into the year already, but here we are. Lots of updates to talk about. Yeah, we got green grass. We get the golf courses open, you know, boat in the water. Everything is uh, is is spring. Spring's, spring's a fun time of the year. Uh, especially in Atlantic Canada after a rough winter. So we're excited for spring. So what do you, where do you want to start with the updates? Um, well, Darren, let's start with the recent Bank of Canada update. So we had an update back on April 10th. Um, it did remain unchanged. So we stayed at that 5% um, interest rate. A uh, couple things that they're looking at now. Now, we're not going to have an update in May. The next update is going to be June 5th. So a couple of things people are kind of keeping an eye on to see if we're going to get those interest rate cuts in June because that's the hot topic, right? Are we going to see those interest rates go down? So a couple things to keep an eye on are inflation, as always, obviously. Um, so right now, inflation sitting at around 2.9%, up from 2.8% uh, year over year uh, increase in February. Now, we don't have our numbers for April as of yet while we're recording this uh, podcast, but my thought is things could change a little bit. So I did pull some stats on gas prices, which is where I'm speculating. We're going to see where the change is going to come from. But as of April 18th, on a national price or a national basis, the price of gas was on average around a dollar seventy four per liter. That's up six point five cents from April tenth, wow. um, and eighteen point seven cents higher than the average in March, according to Gas Buddy. So one of those places we can pull these numbers. So in BC, like gas is hovering around two dollars per liter right now. So that that's high, right? Wow. Now, it, Christina, does anyone? Um Anyone in the food distribution system in Canada use fuel? Like farmers, truckers, warehouses, food producers, grocery stores, do they all use fuel of some sort? Absolutely. The gas yeah. prices impact everything, right? It's Absolutely. a roll down effect. So we're not going to get the consumer price index report until May 21st um, to see how that's going to impact things. And then that's just a few weeks before we'll get that Bank of Canada announcement. So we'll see where inflation sits towards the end of May. Uh, a couple other things that came out in the month of April was stat, uh, Statistics Canada released some information on our retail sales in Canada. So and what they found is that it's still flat. So there was a 0.1% drop in February. There was a 0.3% plunge in January. And now we're flat again. So the first few months of this year, retail sales have definitely slowed down. And we know that the, you know, people are feeling that pressure of the interest rates. They're feeling, um, you know, things, the inflation, things getting higher. So retail sales are down. That they're going to look at, I would say, once um, when they're deciding on that rate cut. Um, after that release, that Statistics Canada release, the two-year Canadian government bond fell about three basis points to 4.25%. And the Canadian dollar weakened about 0.3% um, to just a little under 73 cents, so 72.9. So we've seen an impact wow. on our dollar. So we're seeing an impact on the on the Canadian dollar. Can we, can we just expand on that? What's going on with the Canadian dollar these days that we got to be aware of? Yeah. So a weaker Canadian dollar does raise the risk of inflation. So goods become more expensive, right? So typically when they're looking at cutting interest rates, they're not going to look at, they don't really look at the Canadian dollar so much. But in the last report, Macklem actually said that if the Canadian dollar does move, that's something that we'll take into account in terms of our outlook, right? Now, the reason we have, obviously, we're, we're looking at the U.S. as well. And U.S. came out uh, just recently and said that their dollar, well, we saw that the dollar eased against most currencies um, after data showed that the U.S. economy grew at a surprisingly slow place and inflation came in hotter in their first quarter. So that's why we're sitting around that 73. We're not really dropping any any further. Um, and that's because U.S. is slowing down a bit too. So originally, I think U.S. was saying that they weren't going to make any cuts until December, which didn't look good on us making cuts earlier earlier. Um, but now with that news, we might see the feds make cuts sooner than December. Anyways, they're going to take all of this into consideration when we get that announcement on June 5th and we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes from there. So speculation, a lot of people are saying we're going to see the cuts in June. Um, but all of these things are saying that inflation is going to be higher. So who knows what we'll see. Um, but update June 5th. Okay, cool. Uh, on economic news, of course, we had the budget, and uh, the budget, I, I think, is devastating for the country. 
Um, but we did, we did a whole episode on the budget. So if you want to learn more about uh, our thoughts on the budget, check that out. Um, but but I, I, I like to keep hammering on this productivity, how Canada's productivity versus the world and the OECD countries and America is just shrinking. We're getting less and less productive through the years. Um, and I thought it was interesting. Mark Wiseman, he was the former head of the Canada, Pen- Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. So he was the top investor guy. And that, now he's chairman of, uh, of uh, Lazard Big Money Company. He was interviewed and he said, the whole government's idea of the budget is redistribution of wealth. But they didn't talk about not enough about productivity, according to this Mark Wiseman. And this is the quote I like. If the pie is larger, there's more to re- redistribute. And if we're not growing the pie, we can't spend the way we're spending. So, you know, instead of trying to focus on increasing productivity, which a lot of economic or economists now are speaking out on that Canada needs to do something about the productivity, I think the Canadian government did the exact opposite. They increased the inclusion in the capital gains, which is going to drive capital out of the Canadian market instead of into the Canadian market, which is what we need to increase productivity. So that uh, that's really not great news on the productivity front. But again, I like that all these big economic leaders are addressing it. Um, so it seems to be a topic that seems almost in a, in a crisis mode now. Uh, so hopefully enough people talk about it, we can get the government to try to try to act on it. Um, so again, all kinds on the budget, the capital gains inclusion was the big one. Uh, I don't think it's going to be great at all for the Canadian economy. Uh, it's not going to be great for keeping doctors in the country. It's not going to be great for a number of things. Stock markets, eh, not too exciting in the stock markets. U.S. is up 6.5% year to date, didn't change a lot. Canadian uh, Canadian markets up 4% year to date. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens to the stock market um, over the next six six weeks. So June 25th is when the inclusion rate changes. So instead of half, paying tax on half your gains, you're going to pay tax on two-thirds of your gains inside a corporation. Same thing personally, over 250000 So I was at a, uh, a, a seminar the other day, a tax seminar, and uh, this senior accountant was there from one of the big firms, and he was talking about, you know, about his clients that will be selling a lot of their stocks prior to June 25th to realize the gains where the, where the inclusion rate is lower. And in his kind of, he said the kind of the rule of thumb they're, mo- they're mostly talking about is if you are going to need money in the next two years from that portfolio, it may make sense to kind of look at selling it now to get that lower tax rate today. But if it's something you're going to hold long term, um, then, then there's probably, probably doesn't make sense to, to change it uh, or, or to, to sell it. But, um, you know, he doesn't see a, a situation where this guy was speaking, didn't see a situation where the capital gains inclusion rate was going to go down. Uh, he thinks it's going to go to 75% uh, if the current government gets, gets reelected. So we could see even more increases on that. So that's the stock market. What else are we going to talk about? Your favorite Bitcoin. Oh yes. Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin, some exciting stuff on Bitcoin. Now, it's down about $5,000 in the last month, so it's hovering around 65000 at time of recording here. So that's like down about 7%, but it's still up over 45% year to date, and it's up 130% in the last year. But two big events happened uh, in this past month, pretty, pretty exciting events in, in April. So the number one uh, risk kind of coming into 2024 or tw- even 2023 for Bitcoin was, are the governments going to ban it? So are the governments going to say, you know what, it's it's banned, we can't do it. So we got the answer in the U.S. in January because um, the Securities and Exchange Commission approved the Bitcoin ETFs. So that was basically the government saying, okay, Bitcoin's legit, you're allowed to buy it, you're allowed to you're allowed to sell it, we're gonna we're gonna tax you on it like we do any other capital gain. Um, great, you can do that. Um, so that really allowed a lot of institutional money to flow into it. Now they're talking about, you know fund of funds. So if you have a portfolio, maybe one, two, three percent of that portfolio could go into Bitcoin. That could mean literally tons of money flowing into it. But the new news is Hong Kong just approved their Bitcoin ETF effective April 30th. So again, Hong Kong market's not as big as the US market. It won't have the same impact, but it's basically Hong Kong, mainland China, it, it is them, that government in Hong Kong approving, or the regulators anyway, approving Bitcoin, and it's going to open up the Bitcoin institutional money over there. So again, more acceptance of Bitcoin, I think, uh, think is key. 
And then the other event we've been talking about for the last year is the having. And the having happened. We've halved. We've halved. We've halved. I know. I said, the having happened? It happened? <laughs> having, okay. Ha- having happened. <laughs> so on April 19th, the having happened. So what does the Bitcoin having event mean? So Bitcoin went from roughly 900 new Bitcoins a day to 450 on the, on the having. Let's put that another way. Think of supply and demand. Right now in the world, about 80 million cars get produced a year. If someone snapped their fingers and said, you are only allowed to make 40 million cars a year, effective April 19th, what do you think would happen to the price of new cars? Well, Bitcoin's production has been cut in half from 900 to 450. What do you think is going to happen to Bitcoin long term? So that's the speculation. Now, that happened and Bitcoin dropped and people are saying, oh, I thought, you know, with smaller production uh, or, or less being produced that the, that the price would gain. Well, it was no surprise the halving was coming and we saw this massive run up with the new ETF in January, February. So we saw a massive spike prior to the halving. So what's going to happen from here? I don't know. I'm not giving you Bitcoin advice, but, you know, I think there's a reasonable chance that, you know, once this kind of settles down long term, the supply is going to be half as much. The demand is continuing to increase. It's becoming more acceptable. New ETFs coming out in Hong Kong, government's accepting it. So if demand keeps increasing and supply keeps shrinking, you know, I took a lot of economics courses and that, that, that means price increase. But we're not giving Bitcoin advice. We're not giving Bitcoin <laughs> advice. We're not Bitcoin experts. We're just experts. providing information on what's going on. And I think we, when you told me about the having, I literally said it's, it's, that happened, right? So I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's gotten to the masses that the having has happened either, right? Where you might see a bit of an influx there too. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. So we, so yeah, we didn't see the big spike, but it's, uh, it's really important. So that's going to be for the next four years, and then there'll be another having. Gotcha. All right. So big news on the Bitcoin front. Let's jump into some real estate, um, some real estate stats and what's going on in the real estate market. So the average selling price of a home in Canada increased by zero. So these are our March stats, right? We won't have April until um, kind of further into the month. But our March stats said that, you know, the average selling price of a home in Canada increased 0.7% year over year to around 730000 in March 2024. So that's the average. When we kind of dig into the provinces, though, they tell a different story. Um, it was interesting. Interesting to see, you know, the annual change in price in Alberta is actually up 9.8%. Wow. Um, Ontario is only 0.2%. So things have slowed there. That market slowed down a bit. Uh, another uh, big one that I see here is New Brunswick is up 9.5%. And you hear a lot about people looking to invest in New Brunswick and Alberta, those other provinces outside of the, you know, the BCs and Ontarios. Um, and it looks like things are are moving. Like, obviously, they're going up. We're seeing that appreciation. Uh, other Every province is up here, right? So we're seeing them all up. Not quite some, obviously, like I said, Ontario, not quite as much as others, but even here in Nova Scotia, up 4.8%. So like the appreciation is happening. We're not seeing anything falter there on the real estate side. Now, nationally, there were 30, close to 39,000 homes um, sales in the month of March, which was um, down a little bit from February, but not by much at 38,000. So in Canada is experiencing an unpre- unprecedented level of home unaffordability as home prices have rem- risen by 38% over the past five years, 38. <laughs> and over the past 10 years, 86%. That is, that's a huge increase in affordability. And we know that that really comes down to um, supply and demand, right? We just don't have the real estate, which is why I wanted to dig in. And I, and I want to kind of focus and, and take a look at where this is going, but the stats on new house builds, like how is that coming along? Are we increasing this supply? Is that going to impact these um, increases? So I looked up some of those stats and the trend in housing starts was 243,000 in March, which was actually down from their um, stats in February, which were 247. So we actually so that's came- year over year. Yes. So year over year. So the trend, okay, how they measure it, the trend measure is a six month moving average of the monthly seasonally adjusted annual rate of total housing starts for all areas in Canada. So okay. they call it like the SAR. So um, now out of that though, it was it was kind of cool to see that in Vancouver, housing starts were up 27%, and that's driven by an increase in multi-unit starts. They changed some of those rules there on, you know, adding the homes and, and zoning changes where you could a- increase the units. And then Toronto and Montreal, we saw a decline of 26% and 5% in 
and the multi-unit starts. Wow. And that's about red, like I'd imagine that's about red tape, right? Like the fact that BC, Vancouver did remove some of that red tape we've seen more, but Vancouver doesn't have any more land. Like I don't know where they're putting all these multi-units that they're increasing by. So uh, interesting to see that Toronto and Montreal was down in their housing starts. Yeah. And you think of this new capital gains inclusion. So, you know, for for those that don't know, like when a pre-construction condo buildings get gets built, the way it gets built is they pre-sell about 60%. They need to sell about 60% of the units, okay? Those are predominantly to investors, right? Um, first-time home buyers, they're not buying a condo that's not going to be ready for three, four, five yeah. years with an unknown date, maybe even not to get built. So they tend to be bought by investors. So you need investors to buy 60% of the units. Then the builder can go to the bank and say, listen, I've sold 60%. Give me $100 million or whatever I need to build the building. Well, now we have the capital gains exclusion changed. We have interest rates through the roof. Um, so already we saw in Toronto the number of, of, of new new housing contra- or, or multi-unit shrink. Yep. Now we're going to add in, as of June, this capital gains, gains uh, inclusion, massive tax increase. Uh, it's going to make it even less desirable for investors to buy to buy condo units. So... Yeah, and going and I and I took a step back and was like, okay, so you know, between twenty twenty one to twenty twenty three, what did those new new house starts look like? And keeping in mind that just because they start the house doesn't mean it finishes. Construction usually takes longer, but um, in twenty twenty one, there was two hundred and seventy one thousand. 2022, 261,000, 2023, 240,000. That's trending down, not up. And in that most re- in that budget announcement, they. Um, predicted, I don't know what you'd call it. They said that they were going to be able to, um, you know, 500,000 homes they were going to build per year um, for for new Canadians and for Canadians in general that are just, you know, looking for a place to purchase with that lack of supply. So, um, so interesting numbers to see. So, so let me get this straight. So the last five, 10 years, on average, we've been building around 250,000 homes a year. And now from the same people that brought us the the Arrive Can app and the efficiencies that they, they incorporated there are going to get involved in the housing market. And with the Canadian government's help, that 250000 is going to jump miraculously to 550000 overnight. Yeah, and the problem the is, is... seven years. Yeah, and, and who's building these homes? They're investors that are now getting hit with that capital gains um, tax. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine being able to get those housing starts increased with the red tape that is out there and the cha- and the taxes that they're getting hit with. It would be hard for investors to, you know, to want to invest in Canada, which is what... I would like to bet money on we will not have 550,000 homes constructed every year for the next seven years. If there's some kind of place we can wager on that, let me know because I'm all in. Uh, I just think that's such an unrealistic... Uh, number to throw out uh, in, in in the budget. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I hope we build 550,000 homes, but I can't imagine uh, with today's environment why, how we could almost double uh, housing starts this year. Yeah, and I don't think it's going to decrease the price of the regular home in Canada now either. It's just going to increase. So, yep. All right, so what else, what else we got left? Uh, oh, uh, industry news. Yes. So this was uh, kind of cool. One of the things about um, about a life insurance contract that's really powerful is uh, it bypasses the the will and probate. It doesn't go through the estate. So it doesn't get held up. And then it can't be like fought over by the family. It's like, no, I should get more and I should get more. One of the things we've always had about life insurance is you have a named beneficiary. It goes direct to that beneficiary, bypasses the estate, no probate fees directly. I've seen claims in five or 10 days after death, deliver a check to the, to, to the family. Well, there was a court case in Ontario that went through the went through the court different levels of court, but it was finally decided where this guy was married, divorced, married again, had new kids, but kids with both, um, and he died unexpectedly in an accident at fifty, and he had four insurance policies. Three of them, his mother was the beneficiary, and the fourth one, his current wife, when he died, was the beneficiary, and his current wife, when he died sued and said, no, I should get those three other life insurance contracts that his mother is the beneficiary on and took it to court and said it was, it was unfair. And the court basically ruled supporting the importance of the insurance law and said, no, 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 this goes direct to the beneficiary as per the contract. He signed a contract. He knew what he was doing and, and it was upheld. 
So again, that's just a nice confidence boost to those people with beneficiary designations, especially in first, second, third marriages with kids that are getting different amounts. You can use insurance to get the money to the people you want in the percentages you want without risking going through a whole big legal battle through the estate, through the will, years in court, all kinds of big fights. It's private, it's direct, it just goes to the beneficiary, easy peasy. So great news um, for insurance people. And then control and compound, we got some exciting news. I'll let you share some, but uh, we actually just, uh, we're growing again. We're trying to uh, to grow because our business is, uh, is is growing. We need more people and it's hard to find new people, but we May 1st, we get a new employee that uh, is starting in our admin office in uh, in Halifax or Dartmouth. Um, and we're currently looking for another admin as well to grow. And uh, we're, we're looking at opening uh, maybe another office uh, in another location in Ontario. And uh, so yeah, control and compound is, uh, is growing and things are good there. What else we got going on at CNC? Well, May, we're going to be at the multifamily conference. So I'm really excited for this event. It's going to be a big event in uh, Toronto. There's going to be lots of great speakers there. Um, They've got Jordan Belfort. They've got Robert from the Dragon's Den. They've got Elena Cardone, all speaking. So really big speakers at this event, yourself included. Yeah, yourself included. We've got Darren Mitchell that's going to be speaking there as well. Um, Tickets are on sale. So make sure that you get out and you get those um, tickets so that you don't miss the event. Again, it's May 24th, 25th, 26th. There's a workshop there on the 24th. That's where you'll be speaking at the workshop. So um, yeah, I think it's going to be a really fun event. They've got a lot of uh, cool speakers a lot of different topics. I was actually there last year and it was amazing. Like so much networking. That's probably one of my favorite. It's just meeting lots of new people, um, learning lots of new things. And you always find when you have those bigger speakers on stage, a lot of inspiration. Like you leave there and you are ready to, you know, make like take action and get out there and do things. So always uh, encouraging people to get out if you can get get one of get your ticket. I'm not sure they might sell out. Who knows? Um, so maybe check that out if you're interested. We'll be there in Toronto um, in a few weeks. Yeah, and we, and we have a booth, right? So yep. we'll, we'll have three or four team members there, Christine and I included, and a couple other other couple other uh, control and compound team members. So. Come find us at the booth. Love to love to chat to some listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure if you're there to come over and say hi. We'd love to see you. Uh, and then last month we had some really uh, cool podcasts with some great feedback. I absolutely loved uh, the Mimi Fee one. Mimi is phenomenal. Her her due, del- due diligence checklist when buying a property, uh, it's the best I've seen. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, we answered 11 and a half questions on the infinite banking concept. That was a popular one. We did 12 Lessons from Rich Dad, Poor Dad was a good podcast. And then we broke down the 2024 budget. Um, and spoiler alert, we didn't like it. No, it was a bit of a depressing podcast. It wasn't <laughs> as fun. It wasn't as fun. A little heated. Valuable. Yeah, important valuable. to listen to. Yes, but. yes. But you might like, spoiler, well, you probably already know, but you're going to get frustrated listening to it. <laughs> Um, so coming out this month, uh, I had a kind of bit of a fan girl moment and we, <laughs> so we had Garrett Gunderson is on our podcast this month. So if you don't know who Garrett Gunderson is, he wrote the book, what would the Rockefellers do? He wrote the book, uh, killing sacred cows. He has a new book out, um, money on mass. Like this guy is brilliant. Um, and we got to pick his mind for, you know, 45 minutes and it was amazing. So you are not going to want to miss that podcast. It's going to come out soon. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited about that, Christine. Yeah. Like, like in, in, in our, in our little world in the insurance space, like <laughs> he, he's the only rock star in the life insurance space, right? Yeah. Like, you know, there's people that talk and are popular and get views, but Garrett Gunderson is a freaking rock star in the, in the insurance space, tax space, business owner space. Like he, he, he doesn't, it's not just life insurance he talks about, but you know, New York times bestseller, yep. um, you know, and he shifts your, he's a mind shifter. Like as you're talking to him, the wheels are spinning on how you can change how you're thinking now to make it better, right? So tons of value in listening. Just being able to sit down and chat with him for 45 minutes was awesome. So um, tons of value in that podcast that you're going to want to listen to. We also have a podcast on the insured retirement program. Um, so digging into how we use our high cash value policies in retirement. So that's a big question a lot of people have. So we're going to dig into that. Um, we 
also have surprising paths to insurability. So there's a lot of people out there that think that they might not be eligible for life insurance. And we're, we kind of walk through that and, and kind of demyth a lot of that. So there's a lot of people out there that really are insurable and they think that they might be not be. And uh, we go through those things. We also have um, another business owner focused podcast that's going to be coming out. We're really enjoying, um, you know, finding different topics that are relevant to business owners. So we're going to continue that uh, series and have some more of those come out as well. So really excited for the month of May. Yeah, I think the business owner podcasts, so we're going to start doing more of those because this last budget, like, you know, really the 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 final frontier on how to how to save taxes as a, as a business owner and as an individual, but as a business business owner it, it is life insurance, the importance of life insurance, cash value, life insurance, growing tax free, accessing and tax free, coming out of the coming out tax free, when they increase all the other levels of taxation and we, we're in a tax-free environment, um, the spread now between doing insurance and alternative investments, like there's Huge. there's there's no comparison, right? Like yeah. I heard a senior accountant uh, say the other day, like, you know, it might not sound sexy, but every single business owner needs to be talking talking to someone about, ca- about life insurance, every single business owner in Canada. So we're going to try to do a couple more podcasts on that. Because uh, we work with so many business owners that are that are shocked when we show them the numbers on how valuable uh, this concept is in their business, and after this last budget, it it just skyrocketed in value. So lots more, lots more coming. Absolutely. All right, that's the May update. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have an awesome day.